Thank you for being here today. I know some of you are here for, um, I guess, celebrating a, a birthday. And uh, birthdays come and birthdays go. But thank you. This is the big ones, big 60. And uh, one of my friends says, congratulations. I thought it was pretty good. Never thought it that way. We made it to 60, so congratulations. Hey, you're as old as you feel, right? Amen. You're as old as you feel. Some of you feel. We don't want to go there. You may feel older. You know, it, 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 there's days, there's moments. But I wanted to give God the glory. Every day we get is a gift. Every day that we can stand and walk or think. When you think about all the things that can go wrong, well, there's a lot of things that go right. And sometimes it's easy to get kind of sideswiped and sidetracked on all the things that have gone wrong. So now well, it's just a small thing, but when you lose your set of keys, that's a big thing at the moment, right? <laughs> It's a big deal. Yeah? yeah? You can't find your wallet and you're trying to go somewhere. It's a big deal. But after things settled down, I couldn't find my checkbook this morning. So I was digging in my truck. Oh, that I remembered I hid it. After the fact, I went back into the house in the rain. I had to go back out thinking, oh, yeah, I remember I hid it somewhere. You've done that before, haven't you? 60 years. Started out on the farm, South Aiken. The first 20 years, boyhood years, growing up, playing with big sister. Big brother was already out of the house practically when I came along, so don't have a lot of memories with Kermit in the boyhood years. Only he'd come around once in a while. And it was the way it went. It was, you go his way. Right, Kermit? You had snowmobiles back in the day. Old Polaris's. Well, they weren't old then. Stuff out of the 60s, 70s, 70s. It's just a lot of fun. Growing up in a mink ranch, learning how to work. Learning how to take care of the animals. Um, Doing the work as a young man out of high school. Another older brother said, you're gonna go work for me? All right, here we go, we're going to concrete work. And so we'd already, you know, learned how to dig holes by then, and we were used to using a shovel, we're used to pushing a wheelbarrow, it was no, you know, it was just kind of transition. But there was muscles I never knew I had when I started pulling concrete, and raking and pushing. And and then the block work and all the good stuff. That's my first 20 years kind of a summary. And the next 20 years, God began to deal with me about ministry. And so he called me to himself. I liken it to a deeper relationship with him. I was going to church. I was saved. I was a young boy. I knew, I knew God in a, you know, a personal way, but God wanted me to know him more. So... I felt like I needed to spend more time with him, and that was, that was, that was a, actually a God thing because I, I would probably, my attention span was about five minutes, okay? To sit down and read anything, right? Five minutes, and you're thinking about something else. But little by little, I kept gaining, you know, more attention span. And that's kind of how I developed my prayer life is just getting alone with God upstairs in my bedroom or whatever, wherever it may be. Um, then a, a few, uh, that early, I was 21, I met Carrie. And she was only 17. And Anna's only 17. And I'm thinking, I'd have never let a 21-year-old date my daughter. <laughs> right, Calvin? <laughs> right? Because okay. it worked out. 
And so uh, my truck began to show up at their farm, kind of slow at spurs, but quite regular after a while. Well, that's where we started out. So I was 21. And then I felt God speaking to my heart, preparing for ministry, and I was afraid of that. I was afraid of going to college. I was afraid of speaking in front of people, I was afraid of all that. Yet God was doing something in my heart. In spite of how I felt, God began to put some things on my heart. I remember, I remember this so vividly. I was like having a wrestling match with God, but you know who's going to win? God's going to win. And so I'm tossing and turning in my bed at night. I was thinking, God, I don't, I don't know about this. I, I, don't, I can't do this. I can't do this. And then I finally just got up out of my bed, and I said, yes, okay, Lord, if you work it all out, you work all the details out, I'll go. I'll go prepared. I'll begin to prepare in the process. And that was in those first 20, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. I kind of took the long term plan of college and finished. We finished, Carrie and I finished together in 1987. We were married the last year that we were in college together. And we started out at a different time, but we ended up the same. But God had all that planned out. Last of my 20s. So then we took our first church. Our hometown in Aiken was needing a youth pastor. At the same time, our neighboring town of Palisade, community of 150, uh, needed a pastor. And we started, well, we'll come up. We'll do the youth on uh, Wednesday nights. And we'll be at Aiken Sunday nights. And we'll be in Palisade Sunday morning uh, for service. So that's where we started. And we started living in Kermit's hunting cabin. Right? Remember Kermit? And so he was gracious enough to let us stay there for a couple, three months. Now when deer season came, guess what? You guys need to leave. <laughs> right? And that's the way it worked out. Well, we were ready. We were ready. The parsonage up in Palisade. Well, let's just say we got into it. It had needs, you know, needs. Part of the wall was falling down underneath in, in the basement. Guess what? That's where my gifts came in. And so we started the fire, the stove in the basement. The first, summer, the first winter we fired us, that old, I call it a brontosaurus stove. It's one of those old coal burning stoves with a shroud over it. And it had the heat ducts, you know, in the old days. And I'm sure that was a coal burning thing, but they used wood too. And so it was on a probably 15, 20 below Saturday night that we had Pastor Beecham, our former friend, pastor at Aiken, was up. We were having uh, fellowship time and playing some uh, table game. I kept turning the furnace up like, it's cold in the house. Well, it dawned on me, when's the last time I checked the propane tank? And sure enough, it goes, oh, it is zero. This is on Saturday night, and there's no heat in the house. So what did I do? My instinct kicked in. There's a few sticks of wood over here. Let's fire this thing up. I checked it out with a flashlight. Everything seems to be okay. Fired it up. Heat was coming out, coming up the radiator heat. Carrie goes, I smell smoke. Ah, that's just from opening up. No, I really, we were just ready to go to bed. I smell smoke. So I drug myself downstairs to my uh, surprise was smoke all through the basement. So the first thing I did was I kicked the windows open, got ventilation so I could breathe. And I'm down there literally figuring out what's going on. On top of the shroud, they had laid asbestos and then that accumulated dust. So guess what happened? I peeled the asbestos paper back and flames came off the top of the stove, right? The floor doors were just a few inches. And so I'm down there stomping and she called, uh, Carrie all day, you having a seizure? <laughs> you know, something like that. I said, never mind, I'm fine. I didn't want her to know that there was a fire. And so I'm stomping this stuff, I finally get it out. And we were okay. And we went to bed. And I tell this story to one of our senior, Olga, some of you know who I'm talking about. Olga was one of the saints, she played the piano. She got saved in that church. It's a church that was started back in 1959, actually on my birthday. 
Anyway, long story longer. Um, she says to me, seriously, she, she said, you should have let that place burn down. <laughs> She's so serious. She said she knew she had, that place had issues. And I mean, uh, you know, and, and see, just so you know, when we drove into the community, we said, I hope that's not the parsonage. We said, we hope that's not the parsonage. But guess what? That's the person's. That's where we started. We were there nine years. We had two boys, Cody and Levi. And uh, so we were getting uh, our start in ministry. Uh, the boys remember walking from the house, I'm sure somewhat playing or falling into mud holes along the way in the spring. And uh, they still remember the ceiling. I think they remember some of the details. Carmen helped us put in indoor plumbing. The church didn't have in indoor plumbing at the time. So we kind of brought things up. We helped it along. Now that community has a new church building, and it's all paid for. And I look back. Thank you, Jesus. You are blessed. So that was like our, now, now in the ninth year, God is dealing with me in this community. I was in the process a couple of years. So the next, the next set of 20 years, we've been here 20, I think it's 21 now since we moved to this community, had two girls, and so life just keeps going. Life just keeps going on. And we, and sometimes it's so easy to forget what God has brought and helped you through. There's no, there's no better way to live than in, in obedience to God. It's simple as that. Though sometimes it's hard to be obedient and know what God is actually saying to you. But when you step out, blessings on you. Well, that's kind of a summary of the, of the 60 years. And in some, I was asking Levi, and maybe you can remember this, how many days are in 60 years? 21,915. 21,915. I have lived 21,900 and going on 916 years because my birthday was yesterday. You know what the Bible says? Teach us to number our days. He didn't say, teach us to number our years. All right? Teach us to number our days. What does that speak to us about? He's speaking about a daily walk. He's speaking about a one-day mentality. He's speaking about, as he did in Matthew, that we, don't, we shouldn't worry, but we do. We shouldn't worry about the things, the little details but I believe he was speaking towards what are we setting our hopes on? What are we setting our dreams on? What are we building our house on? What are we standing on that's firm? And the only thing is, is faith in Christ. That's the only way we can get, the long, get through this life to the next is we stand on the, on the bedrock of Jesus Christ. And so we started this little... Dirty back in the Philippians last, last two Sundays. No, we had missionary fill in uh, last Sunday. I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to pick up on this theme again about attitude. A lot of you weren't here the first chapter. So I'm going to repeat something like this that Chuck Swindoll said in his illustration book. He says that 10%, he says he's come to believe that life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% of your attitude. So get that? So 10% is what happens. You can't, you can't control. It's things you can't control. But 90% you can control by attitude. So attitude is a huge thing. And we speak about attitude. We spoke about Paul being in prison in, the, in Philippians 1. That he writes this letter back to his parishioners, back to his believers, back to the fathers, back to those he wants to encourage. And he's saying to them, it doesn't matter if I'm in prison. In fact, it's turning out for the better of the gospel. In fact, the whole, the whole pra praetor and guard, that could be up to a thousand more, a Roman military type people. They're hearing about the gospel. The gospel is, being, is spreading faster and farther because of his persecution. There are other people that are stepping up in his place because of the goodness of God. You see, what Satan tries to squelch the things of God 
it often backfires on them, and God gets the glory. God gets more gain out of it. I just love that. And so when Joseph was in prison, the man who, who his brothers sold in slavery and didn't like because they were jealous, the scripture says what God, what, what was meant for evil, God turned around for, to be for good, to be for your salvation. So what sometimes seems to us is this is hard. This is why, Lord, we don't have an answer. And Paul expresses to them that God is at work. In fact, we learn about the fact that I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work and you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. In other words, God doesn't stop working on us or your loved ones you're praying for or your family. God doesn't stop because if they choose to turn, God doesn't stop going after them, keeping them on his heart. He's looking, he's looking for ways to show himself again to him. So by the time we get to the second chapter, Paul has expressed his confidence in his Lord. His attitude is this, that what, where, whatever it takes as long as the gospel is preached, even if I'm not preaching the gospel, I'm going to preach it where I'm at. For it's in a cell. I'll proclaim it. Well, what do you mean? He proclaimed it by his lifestyle. He proclaimed it by his attitude. And says, guess what? People pick up on our attitude very quickly, don't they? You pick up on attitudes. You pick up on people's stuff that's going on in people's life. And Paul said, I'm hard-pressed. Verse 23. You see, I think Paul had reached to a, a certain degree that, you know, it would be just easy just to kind of step out of this life and into the next. But he made up his mind that so long as the Lord gave him breath, he was going to remain faithful. So that would be very much better. In fact, to go with Christ would be much better. But to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. In other words, what he's saying is that if I stay here, it will be for helping the benefit of your, of your discipleship. I will encourage. So wherever we went, his goal was to encourage. So we strike out in chapter 2. And we read verse 1, if therefore there is any encouragement in Christ. Just think about that for a moment. If therefore there is any encouragement in Christ. In other words, is there any encouragement in Christ? I would think we would all say yes. If there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion... Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent, and one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for the personal interests, but also for the interests of others. What would the world be like if this was role models? What would, the, what would the world be like when you went to work? What would the traffic be like when you're driving through the busy streets? Because others are abiding by the love of Christ, letting each of you regard one another as more important than himself. This is the Christ-likeness. That is what Jesus absolutely did when he came to this earth. He regarded others more important than himself and this is the king of kings and the lord of lords in fact we read that every knee shall bow that's coming up the day is going to come when every knee shall bow every tongue confess that jesus christ is lord guess what i want to be that one now i want to bow now i think you do too i think we want to bow in our hearts now we say lord be lord and i love to declare him lord I like to speak sometimes. I'll be driving along. Lord, I just declare you, be Lord over this day. What you're saying is you will be in control of the circumstances. You control what goes on. You control what happens. You are the one that that's absolutely knows the beginning to the end. And so when we read these passages, 
You see, Paul was an encourager. Why was he such an encourager? Because he knew the rascal he used to be. Part of the reason. He knew what he used to be. He was messed up. He was deceived. He thought what he was doing for God when he was destroying Christians, he thought he was doing service for God. He was religious. He was a Pharisee. He was taught by the, some of the best. He knew the, the law. Yet, Jesus stops him on the road to Damascus and said, Paul, or Saul at first, why are you persecuting me? Why are you coming against me? And he struck him with a bright light. He was blinded, right? But something happened. Something happened in the sight of Saul's heart. Later becomes Paul. His heart began to believe. His heart began to recognize. His heart began to understand the voice of Jesus. He recognizes this is the one in whom he needs to know. And now he's changed. And the church takes time to warm up the pole. You can imagine. The church takes time. But after time went by, he remained authentic. He remained who he was. And he goes on to send us this wonderful letter written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that this is meant for us even down to our day that we live. This word that comes through Christ. See, people aren't so interested in what you know, they are interested in more who you know. When people sense that you know Jesus, they have, you become an encourager. And guess what? I don't have all the answers. No one has all the answers. No wonder, no, no one can understand any pain unless you've been there. But Jesus, the one, the only one, understands the pain of anyone's heart. He understands the pain. He understands what's going on in your thinking. He understands your thought from afar off. And he wants us for himself. That's huge. Our problem sometimes is this. We don't feel good enough. We don't feel worthy. We don't feel like we're valuable enough. You know what that is? The trick of the enemy. Don't let him push you down. The scripture speaks that we've been bought with a price. We've been bought with this precious blood. When he allowed himself to be crucified. When he came out of heaven, he had this attitude, and we've seen the next verses. Though he existed, he was, he was equal with God. He was God. He did not regard this equality. He, in other words, it's a, it's a thing to be grasped. What he's saying, I did not take advantage of myself being God. At this moment, he emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant. This is why so many of the religious people didn't, didn't recognize him, because he came as, as a, a servant. He came as one who was a, uh, allowed himself to be broken for us. A shameful death, the death of a cross. What is at that cross? where we have the victory. It's at that cross where our sins are once and for all forgiven. That's because of the cross that we can live and have our being. That's because of the cross that we can get up and have anything to say for Jesus' sake. That's because of the cross that we can live and have our being. The cross frees people. The cross delivers people. The cross is level at the cross and the ground is level everyone is the same we're all sinners saved by the grace of god but the cross makes it possible for us to be born again at the cross what an attitude paul had an attitude of allowing 
one who knows the beginning to the end. He allows him for a few moments and a few days. He lost his eyesight, but something beautiful was happening within. His eyes of the spiritual man were, were being opened. The eyes that he wrote later in Ephesians, I pray that your eyes will be open, all enlightened all the more, that you more, may even know more of the depth and the width and the riches. So often I wonder, why does that one have to suffer? Why did that one have to go through this or that? And sometimes I just say, I don't know. Why did Job? Why? And then the question is why? We have lots of whys. But who knows the answer? It's Jesus. And sometimes we can only know him better. We can only come to get closer to the pain and the suffering. And in the body of Christ, you don't have to look very far in this culture. And sometimes in the cultures we live, it looks good on the outside. But I dare say, there's a crisis every corner. There's a crisis connected to every family here in some way. There's been a crisis. There's, there's moments of pain. There's hurt. There's, there's, there's strain. There's stress. But all in all, Jesus understands all that stuff that is going on. And the Bible says, as we read on, God, verse 13, who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasures. God is at work in you. Backing up, it says, work out, work out your salvation. Notice it didn't say work for your salvation. Verse 12, work out your salvation. In other words, you work out your walk. You work out, listen, I almost titled this message, I'm a work in progress. In fact, that's probably a good, good title. I'm a work in progress. Amen. Amen? And it's freeing. You know what? I have not arrived. The day will come. And I shall be changed. You shall be changed. You shall be like him. And you shall see him as he is. I'm on this road. I'm on this journey. I started out as a young boy. Receiving Christ several times. Wanting to be sure. I remember Glenn Galls. Remember Linda? You remember Glenn Galls? Dear man of God, often he would be the first to testify. He'd always say, God is good. First thing out of his mouth, God is good. Well, I reckon I got familiar with his voice as a young boy. So now I'm praying at an altar one night, and the altar call was given. Just come and pray. And I'm just down there bawling and praying. I don't know how old I was, maybe six, five, six, seven. Can't remember exactly. But I remember this. I remember Galt, Glenn Galt's voice, Jesus. All he said was, Jesus. He's laid his hand on me. And now I'm just feeling all the more the presence of God. When I got off that floor, I remember walking outside, looking out the stars, and knowing for sure I've been I'm saved. I know God is in me. But something was special because there was an older gentleman that pray, help me pray through. And says, this is what he's talking about. You will have moments. You know that people around you know how to pray. If you know a person that prays, sometimes don't be afraid to say, would you pray for me on this? Would you pray with me? Would you be in, be in uh, part of the combat? Would you help? See, if there, verse 1 of chapter 2, if there is any encouragement in Christ, one of the greatest things that encourages people is the sense that you care about them. You don't have to have the answers. 
but you care and you are going to take it to prayer. Affection. People are starving for it. People are starving for fellowship. Now, I'm not putting down the bars, okay, but I don't go along with the alcohol thing. But you notice in every community the bars are full these days. What is that all about? They're hungry for affection. They're hungry for fellowship. And wouldn't it be interesting as we the church would start to pray as we go by these bars and say, Lord, help me to reach some person. Help me to be an encouragement to some of those. Wouldn't that be a turnaround? I believe that the culture is sick and tired of being let down, of being told one thing, yet they see another. They're sick of it. And so they're choosing not to believe anything. They're starting to just form their own opinion. And so what's needed to happen, we have to live it out and be authentic. We have to demonstrate what the scriptures of the Psalms dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Dwell in the land. And if some of you have lived in your community for over 30, 40, 50, 60 years, God can use that because you've developed relationships and you can be a witness. If you're just starting out in this community, as Carrie and I came into this community 20 years ago or more, we didn't know anyone. We went to the restaurant. We don't know anybody here. We go to the football game. We don't know anybody here. But after time went by, pretty soon we begin to recognize people begin to recognize, people begin to identify. That's how we encourage one another. The body of Christ, you begin to find brothers and sisters, even if they don't go to this church, it doesn't matter really doesn't matter. We are brothers and sisters. We are going to live in heaven together. We might as well get used to getting along now, right? We might as well just face it. I might have to sit next to someone that I thought, whoa, whoa, I don't know if I can, you know, agree on everything. The cross is level. Keep the main thing, the main thing. Sometimes it's this way as brothers and sisters. We, we have to agree to disagree. What do I mean by that? That means don't get mad at each other and have it out. That's what it means. Don't become enemies, but be encouragers one to another. Because we read this passage The second chapter, I love this verse 14. Tell me you guys want your kids to see that, right? Right? But that's for everybody, by the way. In fact, that's for moms and dads and grandpas and grandpas and great grandpas and grandpa, great, great, go on and on and on. It's from the youngest to the oldest. How often I've been guilty, grumbling about the weather, grumbling about something falling apart on the car. Yeah. I take my eyes off of Jesus and I start to, I start to drown. I'm like Peter. I was doing okay as long as my eyes were on Jesus. But I start to get swallowed up. When I start thinking, how am I going to do all this in my own strength? And I begin to swallow, be swallowed out. Do all things without grumbling and disputing. It wasn't very long. Here, here's a good statement. Here's what our Bible teacher, Vern, said last Wednesday at Bible study. We were talking, we're going through the book of Exodus, and now the, 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 the Israelites have been just released. Pharaoh said, get out of there. You're, you're killing us. The last plague was death. And so now they go through the Red Sea, 
And now once they're through all that, the great miracles that happened, it wasn't very long, and pretty soon they started grumbling, right? Oh, he brought us out here to die. What in the world? There wasn't any graves in Egypt? All this murmuring. I mean, there's two, probably two million people. Someone said it was the size of Minneapolis. Imagine the pressure. Now listen. God dealt with him. But here's what this, my friend Vern said. It took him one, God, one day, it really one day, what he meant, it took one day to get all of them across the Red Sea and out of Egypt, but it took 40 more years to get Egypt out of them. See, we accept Christ. And now we're just beginning. God sees the potential that you have in him. And oftentimes we can think, well, we're not making the progress like we want to. And we get down on ourselves. Listen, you stay with it. You stay with the word. You remind the enemy that who's, who you are. I belong to Christ. I stand on him. He is my salvation. Work out your salvation, not work for it. Work it out. Learn how to use this word as a sword. A slice. It will cut through condemnation. It will cut through uncertainty. It will cut through the adversary. It will bring you to a place where you are in humility, that you become more interested about other people than yourself. Wow, now we're making progress. Now we're on the way of maturity. When we see someone like a Saul who came 180 degree turn, he becomes from a self-seeking person to come turn around and become a self-giving person. He gave himself away. He spoke the truth. He lived the life. And he says to Peter, and verse, I'll wrap it up with this. You, that you may prove yourself, verse 15, to be blameless and innocent children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse, what, a crooked and perverse? You mean a crooked and, you mean our culture? Yeah. We're, we're crooked and perverse. Our culture has become crooked and perverse. We become wavering. And so the church, all the war needs to take a stand. You don't have to be mean about it. That's not what this is talking about. This is taking your stand. You, you be just begin to love on people. You begin to listen to people. You know, there's a question. This, is how, this might help encourage some of us that are quiet like me. And somewhere along the line, I, I learned if I can ask the right questions, then people won't think I'm quiet. They think I'm interested in them, and then they want to talk. So then they do all the talking for me. <laughs> That's how I've gotten by 60 years. But I never knew that at first. So the first 20, I was kind of hard to make eye contact, you know, and didn't know what to say, you know, kind of the shy thing. But the Lord kept working on me. And he's still working on me. But it gets fun when God's... No, you know God is helping you, and he gives you the wisdom, he gives you understanding. And the greatest thing of all is he puts love in your heart for people. I mean, I'll be the first one to admit, people wear me out. Do I gotta get away? Get alone with Jesus or get in the woods? That's okay, Jesus did the same. But he always, came back with a word or came back with someone. He always looked for his people. Sometimes people would find him as a one woman pressed through the crowd. What a, what a story. And she was determined to get to Jesus. What would happen if you begin to pray that our community would be turned around and to be a neighbor? To, you know, they're, they're not on the right path. What would happen if you begin to pray and that they would get hungry for God. It's a simple prayer. You see, in order for a person to receive Christ, they have to want him. 
They have to understand they need him. And so the Holy Spirit does the changing. And so we need to pray. So in the last closing moments, no matter what it takes, Lord, no matter how long it takes, if it's on their deathbed, if it's someone you love, may they get there, may they make it in because you prayed, because you lived a life that demonstrated Christ-likeness. And maybe they call you when they're in a tough place. As you've earned the right to be heard. You've earned the respect. This is the long haul, friends. This is for the long haul. We're not just accepting Christ to get to heaven, but we're accepting Christ to help others get to heaven, to help others be ready. And so these last few moments we pray in Jesus' name. Right now, we are all on even ground. The cross is where you paid the price, the humility, the shame, the brokenness. Lord, to think that you would choose us Lord, that you would call us before we were even in any kind of way, shape, or form, even living for you. You touched us. You spared us even though we didn't know what we were destroying ourselves like a soul, and you turned us around. Thank you, Jesus. And you're keeping us. In spite of what we may be facing, I pray that there will be encouragement to the body of Christ today. And Lord, we will look up and we will say, our Lord cometh soon, and we shall bow, we shall allow him to be Lord. And so, in Jesus' name, come afresh in our hearts today. We welcome you into our hearts. We believe that you conquered sin and death. We believe that we can only be saved through you. And so we pray that prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I had one song that uh, I thought would fit our theme and our message. It's the king of my heart. It's, it repeats a lot about you are good, you are good, you are good. You guys know that one? Yeah. So we're going to do that in closing. And then we're going to have, if you need to go, go. But we're going to have party time. Okay? So... We're going to go downstairs and fellowship, uh, celebrate someone's birthday, and so forth and so on. Please stand if you will.